And if you do not know by now, he is also the president of the Malaysian Bar, uh, which technically makes him my boss <laughs> in the Bar Council. So, without further ado, I invite Stephen Tiru to present his <coughs> paper. Thank you, Shah. Good morning, uh, Tan Sri Simon Sipon, uh, Ms. Cynthia Gabriel, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The Bar Council believes in transparency and uh, we of course reject this notion of official secret as it is. So the first order of business today is for me to disclose what is not an official secret. Uh, it is Shah's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday Shah, he's all of 22 years old. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here today to speak to you on, the, on this topic. Um, I, I decided, uh, speaking to Cynthia, that I would just not talk about uh, the OSA uh, because to look at the OSA uh, uh, in the context of freedom of information uh, is really to look at issues in a silo. Uh, we, we need to look at this uh, concern that we have of really transparency, accountability and responsibility in a holistic and a comprehensive manner. And uh, that's what I've proposed uh, to do today uh, in, the, in the slides that I've prepared. Um, I think some of these things are really trite. Uh, we really live in an age where there's a deluge preponderance of information, whether relevant, good, trivia or trash. Uh, but it is accepted, it's a must that uh, information, the need for information is to be promoted and it, it, it's really something that pro uh, promotes an informed uh, citizenry uh, and, and a, a, a group of citizens that can participate in the decision-making process. And that's really not something new because uh, James Madison, the famous American, uh, when the U.S. Constitution was crafted, argued uh, for the First Amendment, and he said that you need to create a nation where knowledge will forever govern ignorance, that people must arm themselves with the power that knowledge brings. And I think that pretty much uh, captures, and that was said many centuries ago. Uh, but we also must accept that the right to information, like all rights, must be balanced. It cannot be an open-ended right. And you need to take into consideration issues of uh, security, public order, decency, privacy, in a, in a very broad sweep. But it's how we handle these restrictions that determine whether or not the right to information is a right that uh, we can claim to have any value or whether it's just a meaningless right uh, that we speak about. Today, we see governments everywhere attempting to block information, using public interest as an excuse to do that. But really, when one pierces that public interest uh, shield, uh, it is government interest, it's not public interest. And therein lies uh, the debate. But that is a battle that governments today find that they are increasingly losing uh, with the uh, existence of moles, but really whistleblowers, who for a number of reasons, certainly for conscience purposes, leak official and confidential information to the media. That raises another issue, are these whistleblowers really public benefactors, people that uh, we, we look up to because of what they do, or are they public <coughs> nuisance? Right? It really, really dep depends on which uh, part of the political spectrum you are in, and in terms of the information that is disclosed. Now, but we start, as we must, uh, looking at our federal constitution. Now, Freedom of speech and expression is a fundamental liberty, a right that is guaranteed under Article 10.1a. The big misconception that we have always when we talk about freedom of uh, speech and expression is to look at the restrictions. And, and we are always told that, look, it is, uh, yes, it's a right, but it's a right that is much curbed by the restrictions that one finds in Article 10.2. There are two things that must be borne in mind. The restrictions that can be imposed on any fundamental right 
under our federal constitution are laws which we call enabling laws. That simply means you don't need to pass a law. There's no necessity or a requirement that you pass a law. But if you choose to pass a law, and it could be on grounds of public security, uh, law and order, uh, and the like, then it's important that the law that you pass should not be a law that snuffs out or a law that removes everything in the fundamental liberty to make it meaningless. A good example, an example that I'll get into shortly is of course the OSA, and a current example is the Sedition Act. It's a law that is so extreme in its scope and application that Article 10.1a is rendered meaningless, worthless. That renders that law in its face unconstitutional. Now, freedom of speech, it's really, I mean, there's many ways to put it, but I thought it was good to actually put it this way. It's right to tell people what they either want to know or not want to know. It can be upsetting, it can be uncomfortable, it can be shocking, but it needs to be told. It needs to be told so that a, a, a debate is generated, indeed a ro robust debate is generated, and some sort of understanding uh, comes about out of that. Again, I go back to the Sedition Act. That's one of the biggest problems we have the Sedition Act because it shuts you up. It's a law that shuts you up. All right? And because it's a law that shuts you up, there's no debate. And when there's no debate, you'll all agree with me, there can be no progress. But governments the world over, they set up defensive barriers to this, what I would call frank communication. Frank and open co communication that should be the heart and soul of open government. So there must, to balance that, there must be to balance that what we would call legal transparency. And legal transparency can only come through freedom of information. There is a big debate out there whether freedom of information is part of freedom of speech and expression. Let me tell you that debate should end. It must be part of freedom of speech and expression. Otherwise, it's meaningless. It cannot be floating anywhere else. And I'll show you shortly that international instruments in, under international law recognize it as such. But you know, we, we know there is a double dim dimension to freedom of expression and indeed information, the right to impart and the right to know. Uh, but when we break it down in terms of its importance, it is really one of the main things that we are faced today is corruption. And how ideal it is that we are here today to discuss this issue when we've had an earth-shattering disclosure six days now, five days, the day before, no, seven days now, that there is corruption, drug trafficking and other crimes, in 80% of our, our enforcement agencies. It is not every day that we get that sort of a revelation. <coughs> and that's a revelation that comes from within government. It's not a revelation that is being spun about by a rogue whistleblower or a mole outside there. It comes from a special branch report. And is it not a matter of utter frustration that we've had this mind-blowing, earth-shattering disclosure for over seven days and we've had almost nothing done about it? So you've got to ask yourself this. There is then freedom of information. The information is out there, but there is no enforcement or no will to act on that. that. So what do you do about that? So you have a number of countries, I think you saw uh, it being put up there just now, that a number of countries have FOI legislation. Uh, how it works, to what extent, it will obviously differ. But look at the countries that have them. China has them, India has them, Thailand has them. They've implemented some form of law. But uh, to our utter shame, apart from two states, we do not have a federal law on something that is so critical. Instead, we have today another piece Another archaic law, just like the Sedition Act, that remains on our statute books to haunt us. Like the Sedition Act, it's a progeny of uh, UK law. It comes from, uh, it's drawn from the Official Secrets Ordinance, uh, or the Official Secrets Act, I'm sorry, of the UK, 1911-1920. And please bear in mind, it was a law that was passed at the outset of the First World War. We've gone to the Second World War, and uh, there's much development in the UK. There's FOI legislation in the UK. And it was not a law that was passed without safeguards. 
It was a law that was passed with two critical safeguards, that if there was going to be prosecution, it would be trial by jury. So you would be judged by your peers. Te secondly, you couldn't, the prosecution could not easily uh, 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 be commenced. There, are, there were procedures that the prosecutors had to comply with. So there were safeguards. Those safeguards are absent in our law. It was a law intended uh, to protect government secrets on, on grounds of national security, uh, to cover the obtaining or the uh, impartation of any communication that could be considered secret, prejudicial to national, uh, national interests. And whether the person is a communicator or innocent recipient, both would be, be caught. That is the broad sweep, national security, defense of the realm, intended to capture or to target spies, saboteurs, these extreme people who were uh, bent on uh, harming the national security in the interests of the country. That was really the, the scope of it. It was never intended to, as we heard today, to cover the data on our environment as to whether or not uh, the haze has gone out of control. Right? Uh, certainly, uh, there's no required, there is, uh, that does not exist in the UK. But it's a law that uh, puts a break on the flow of information from government and it has the effect of reducing accountability, transparency, and accountability and transparency must equal responsibility. Uh, to give you a broad sweep, uh, it's a very technical law, but I don't intend to go through section by section. As I said, I, I, I prefer to look at this in a, in a holistic manner, at the different angles that are that, to it. It really says official secrets cannot be received, retained, re released, unless you have prior authorization. Where the authorization comes from, so you'll come to shortly. Section 8 is the offence provision, pain of imprisonment, all right, for anyone for communicating any official secret, it's one to seven years. But the entire law turns on what is really an official secret. Since 1972 till now, we really don't know. We really do not know what an official secret is or what, what document is caught by an official secret because of the way the law is cast. We know an official, the, uh, the Act defines an official as anybody who, uh, an official is something that relates to public service. Public service is defined. So it's really, you think, documents that emanate from an official in public service. Whether somebody who is governed by Article 132 of the Federal Constitution, a local authority, a state body, or a body declared by the minister. But see how wide that is. Now then, Section 2 attempts a definition of official secrets. All right. And you would think that, and you would expect that, given that we are dealing uh, with a law that carries with it penal sanctions, that you would have a law that is precise. In other words, you and I must know what is a document that is caught or is to be regarded as an official secret document. But it does not help really to look at uh, the definition of the official secret. It's a sweep of all federal cabinet documents, state executive council documents, and documents concerning national security, defense, and international relations. And Section 2A allows the minister to add to that list. If that is wide enough, look at the second category. Any information relating to the documents above. So it's just not a document, but anything that comes out of that document. And how far does that go? All official documents which are classified as secret, Rasia Basa is, I suppose, either big secret or very secret. Sulit is confidential. Terhad is limited by the minister or public officer charged with the responsibility concerns. So somebody decides, and that person is a final say on it. Then comes this provision, and you read this together with Section 2 because that's how a document is uh, classified. So it is a minister or public officer who, with, who is charged with the responsibility and the other personalities mentioned there, there, they would decide a document is an official secret document and that decision under this law is treated as conclusive, meaning, meaning taking it to its extreme, although wrongly, it is something that is beyond the scrutiny of the courts. That no court can then say, uh, well, we disagree with you uh, that this is an official secret. Now, this is not something that our courts, thankfully, have accepted because we at least have two cases where the courts uh, have taken issue with this because uh, 
The way it's been construed is you have the three categories in section two that I mentioned, and they are broad enough. And then you have section 16A, where it see where, well, the authorities have taken it as if they can actually go beyond section two and classify anything they want as confidential and, uh, and caught by official secrets. But in these two cases, the courts rejected that and said, you can't go beyond section two. You've got to come back to section two because it's really not something that you can call and decide. And this is again not something that is new. Uh, we've had this debate in the UK uh, where who decides whether a matter is of national importance or national, sec national security really? Is it the minister or the courts? There's a time when the English courts took the view that they would defer that to the minister. It's the minister that, that decides whether or not a matter is of national security and therefore beyond the eyes of the courts. But that changed. That changed some 20, 30 years ago when the courts said that it will not rely on the mere say-so, Latin mere ipsi dixit, of the minister as to what is national security. The minister will be required to disclose that to the court, all right, under confined circumstances for the court to come to a conclusion whether it's so. So you cannot have and, and that, that should be the challenge, really. I, I don't see that really being argued in these cases. I may be wrong. Um, that, should have, that should be the approach we take, that you, you cannot defer to, uh, to the executive to decide on what is a matter of national security and therefore uh, something that qualifies to be categorized as official secret. The courts should have the right to review, lest it be abused. Now, when one looks at the documents or the information that we are concerned with, the content, the nature, the importance of the document is irrelevant to a prosecution. The document could really have information that is very useful uh, for a prosecution. But if it is categorized as official secret, that's the end of it. So let's take the recent disclosure of 80% corruption within uh, the enforcement agencies at our borders throughout the country. We say, it is said that that's in a, in a special branch report compiled over 10 years, 10 years of surveillance and investigation. Is that document classified? Is that information important, first of all? Of course, in terms of content, nature, and importance, I don't think anybody can dispute that that is important. But if it is classified for some reason by a minister today as official secret, that's the end of it. As important and as you and I will agree and say that's, that's necessary to come out, it can't come out. It extends to even information that could be very trivial, and it's out. So there is really no safeguard in the Act against arbitrary or unnecessary or improper classification. The minister decides. And the, the classification that is made uh, by the minister uh, is it's, it's up to the minister, and it's only really up to the minister or the officials that are listed in Section 2B uh, to decide whether the, it remains classified or is to be declassified. And it applies to both citizens and non-citizens. And the OSA has also extra jurisdic jurisdictional reach, which means if the document is not disclosed or the information is not disclosed in Malaysia but outside the borders of Malaysia, uh, you can still be subject to prosecution. When, it, when, I, when I said just now the content and the importance is not important, so it's not a defense really for somebody to say, look, it really exposes corruption. It exposes corruption. Please look at it. It's clear corruption. That's not a defense. It's not a defense to say, well, you know, I innocently received it, but I see it's important, and I have now decided to expose it quite innocently. If it is caught by official secrets, or by, by, by the definition of what is an official secret, that's the end of it. And it's also not a, uh, not a defense if the information is already out there. It's already in the public domain. Somebody released it. Somebody released it, and really you can't, uh, the, the long arm of the law can't reach that person. But if it is you who then decides to disseminate it and to spread it, then that's still not a defense. So the perception you get, and really you need to just look at that. There are many other provisions in the Act in terms of how uh, uh, the prohibitions work in terms of dissemination, but that really is the heart of the act, and that's bad enough. That's bad enough because there are really no safeguards. There are enough provisions there for abuse, for authorities to take uh, a view that a document is protected when it ought not to be protected, and it lends to the perception that it is there to 
hide excesses, mismanagement, and corruption at, at the highest levels of government. It does not help good governance. It does not contribute to good governance. I mentioned that uh, freedom of information it is, is not a matter of just municipal law. It is recognized in international law. And our OS, OSA certainly does not meet those international law obligations. Whether it's Article 19 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights or Article 19.3 of the ICCPR, it's clear. Freedom of information uh, is a recognized international right and the OSA does not sit well with it. Today, Malaysia is a non-permanent member of the Security Council. We cannot thumb our, nose, our noses to these basic rights. Basic rights that are the province and uh, the right of all citizens. Then we have also non-UN instru uh, instruments and uh, you have the Johannesburg Principle which sets out very clearly. So, you know, uh, to argue that this is not a matter of international law, I think it's an argument that is well misplaced. Uh, there is enough material out there to show that uh, uh, <coughs> freedom of information is a matter of international law, if not in the documents, certainly in customary international law. I moved to a different area because uh, the bar, C4, and a few, a TI, uh, and uh, the Citizens Network, we, we have worked on a reform initiative with the MACC. This tells you roughly what that reform in initiative is. I'm going to take you shortly to the part that but that deals with the OSA and the Whistleblowers uh, 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 Act. Uh, it is really in terms of setting, ma making the, 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 uh, the MACC independent from the executive because the MACC today is under the Prime Minister's department. So uh, uh, the, the thrust of the initiative is to establish an independent constitutional commission that will deal with all matters of policy and direction and recruitment in combating corruption. It will be helmed by a constitutionally mandated uh, chief commissioner <coughs> who will enjoy security or tenure, which simply means that he, will, he or she will not be answerable to the executive for tenure. Uh, it will consist of a commission, which for the first time will be, be proposed, is a commission that will have members of civil society, and we are able to show that there are international, uh, uh, there are uh, anti-corruption commissions constitutional anti-corruption commissions in other countries that adopt this model because of the nature of corruption which can be so widespread and wide reaching and we've, we, we want this commission to sit above the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, corruption agency that we have under the MACC who run uh, the day-to-day -day activities of detection, investigation and nuts and bolts of corruption. That's really the broad picture that we're looking at to end if one were to summarize that, it's really to take the MAC out from where it is today and put it at a different place, a place where it will enjoy the independence that it has to have and a place where with that independence it will be accountable and responsible for the functions it ought to uh, perform. As part of that initiative, we have proposed amendments to the MACC Act. That's really in terms of uh, some offenses for corruption. Amendments to the Official Secrets Act. I'll stop here, I'll say this, uh, yes, the primary position should be that the act should be repealed. If it is to be kept, then it should only deal with those defined areas that I mentioned at the very outset, national security, defense of the realm, targeting sab saboteurs and, and uh, uh, persons who are out to, to damage national security in, in that sense, and, and, and spies obviously, uh, in that limit. But in this initiative, we, we, we didn't see that that is really going to wash to ask for the OSA to be just repealed. That's not going to happen, so we have proposed certain uh, amendments to the OSA. And likewise, the Whistleblowers Protection Act and the Witness Protection Act. Believe you or not, we have a Witness Protection Act. Uh, I do not know whether anybody has been protected under the Act or anybody has been taken in. There's no data out there. Right. Uh, what are the reforms? And essentially, when you look at these reforms, uh, this is uh, all, uh, the backdrop to it would be the freedom of information right that uh, I spoke about shortly. The first and most important reform is we must deal with the definition of official secrets under the Act. At the moment, it's too wide and unwieldy, open to abuse. Your official secret could not be my official secret and it could be somebody else's official secret. That's where we are. 
and we cannot have such an untenable uh, situation. So if, uh, if you're going to look at something that has to be categorized, perhaps those areas of national security, defense of the realm, and even foreign relations, although that has to be looked at carefully. Who classifies? I believe the report deals <coughs> with that, may not go into that. But again, there is just too many. I think somebody said Tom, Dick, and Harry. There is. The act actually places the power into too many hands to classify uh, something as an official secret. We, we need to curb that. Uh, we need to have persons who would be accountable to us. Accountable to us meaning people who would answer in parliament, the people we, we elect, or officials who would be otherwise answerable. It cannot be left to the wide category of persons that today we have under the act. Cabinet and State Executive Council decisions should not remain classified unless those earlier considered. Why should it? And, and these discussions that are meant to benefit us as citizens, mm. should we not know how these decisions were made uh, and what's in, in the pipeline for us? Uh, to classify it certainly does not help good governance and it's not uh, something that you'd call an open government concept. Judicial review. Today, if you look at the, uh, the OSA, one may argue that there is an ouster of judicial review because of uh, the conclusiveness of the certificates. Of course, we have two decisions that I put forward, but those decisions really are high court decisions. They don't go too far. Uh, and uh, we do not have a strong pronouncement that, uh, that uh, judicial review does lie. And any official who claims that the particular document is covered by official secrets or is an official secret document must be able to justify it to a court of law. And the court of law should be the final uh, determiner of whether a document uh, is uh, an official secret document. Then there is this entire question of, can you just classify a document and leave it there to, f to, to rest for, for forever as an official secret document? Two approaches, I think. Uh, a document can be classified and there can be a time limit with a review to it. Or you must have in the law, and I think that's uh, a pro possibly a better approach, uh, uh, a formula for periodic declassification or an automatic release of the information to the public domain after a passage of prescribed time. I believe that's the approach the US takes. I believe that's the approach that you find in the freedom of information laws in the UK. And finally, we must, we must have a federal law of freedom of information. So if you are willing to accept that you can have the OSA for those limited areas that I mentioned and not as it is today, which would mean the, uh, the act, even if it's to remain, would have to be heavily amended, that still has to be balanced, lest there be anything that falls between the cracks. That, sh that should still be balanced with a freedom of information uh, law at federal level. We have one in Penang, and we have one in Selangor, and I think uh, uh, there will be, Hannah will be speaking about that later. I won't go into that. The Whistleblower, uh, Whistleblowers Protection Act has a major problem because it sets out rightly to uh, encourage persons to come forward as whistleblowers. Uh, it gives a measure of protection to these persons uh, who want to be whistle who who have come out as uh, uh, as whistleblowers, but section six reverses almost everything that it achieves because section six says that you can disclose information so long that it 's not specifically prohibited by any written law so if the information that uh, you have be it corruption or any other uh, any evidence of mismanagement or impropriety. And if that is covered by the OSA, then you can't disclose it. And if you do disclose it under the Whistleblowers Protection Act, then there is a sanction. Likewise, previously under BAFIA, today under the Financial Services Act 2013, and there's a, there's a case in court at the moment, all right, that's prohibited. So really it nullifies, it reverses, I say, the whole thing. The whole, I mean, uh, if you're looking at information that uh, would be uh, useful in terms of coming up in, in the public domain, much of it is actually in the public side, and much of it under the present law would be classified. And you're really not going to get uh, much information coming out. So the Whistleblowers uh, Protection Act of 2010 uh, is really defeated by the existence of the OSA and any laws, secrecy laws 
uh, uh, that we already have. So we are, have proposed that if you're going to, uh, we, and we want to keep the Whistleblowers Protection Act, then it requires particular amendments that will give defence or will give a defence to, to persons who would disclose information that are caught by, say, the OSA, the Financial Services Act, and so on. So these are the obstacles. Uh, we have the OSA. Let's not forget the Sedition Act. Then the, the Printing Presses and Publications Act. Those remain there. Uh, we have concerns about both the Slango and the Penang FOI. Uh, that will be discussed later. I'm not going to get into that. Perhaps it's not as, uh, as far-reaching as it should be, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent start. It's an excellent start that, uh, that we, we have that in the corpus of our laws. Then we had this amendment uh, into the, uh, the, 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 the penal code. Uh, 2013, but I think it just came into force. It, it could have just come in. This is really to, to prevent civil servants from disclosing information that they acquire uh, in the course of their, their service. And it imposes heavy punishment uh, to, to civil servants. So it will deter whistleblowers from uh, the civil service who wish to expose acts of corruption within the public service. Some matters of conclusion, I, I've just set out some things. Uh, there are a number of in interesting developments that we have seen on freedom of information, certainly in the past three or four years. Uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange certainly come to mind. Then there's the Snowden affair uh, that, uh, that is, that's, that's still raging. And so the world at large has, 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 has had to come to grips uh, with freedom of information on one side, national security and other concerns on the other side. Uh, there are a number of suggestions. You have this. Uh, these are very general suggestions about what you should do, right, so that the right to freedom of information remains a valuable and uh, a right that, uh, that, that is useful in society. But I'm really interested in what Jeffrey Robertson said. Jeff Jeffrey Robertson was one of the, uh, well, he was lead counsel for Julian Assange at one stage. And, uh, and he looked at this in terms of how journalists, journalists and those in journalism uh, can advance freedom of information. And this is some of the suggestions that he made. Admittedly, he said that uh, not exhaustive. One, citizens everywhere have a presumptive right to know what a government does in their name. I think we can't argue against that. If you live in a dem democratic society and you choose your government, then we have a right to know uh, what they're up to in our name. Governments and their public servants and contractors bear sole responsibility for protecting properly classified information and the sources that have supplied it. Two things there, properly classified information, a recognition that there can be information that can be classified, and a protection of sources where it is not that, but there are in, uh, persons who come forward, and these persons should not face uh, the might of the law. Uh, we have this... Uh, rather uh, disturbing practice in this country that it is not the whistleblower's evidence that is acted upon, but it's the whistleblower that is acted on. So when somebody actually comes forward with information, you don't really investigate the information, no matter how uh, earth-shattering it may be, but you'd want to investigate the whistleblower and find out where he got the information from. That's really missing the board, isn't it? But that's, that's what we have. And that's something that uh, Jeffrey Robertson says that you, know, you can't have because you really need to protect that person. And you need to protect that person because you want others to come forward. You want others who would have that spirit and, and the courage to come forward with the information that they have uh, in the name of transparency, openness, uh, and accountability. Outsiders who receive or, or communicate confidential government information should not be prosecuted unless they have obtained it by bribery or duress or illegal hacking or have actively incited a source employed by the government to breach his or her duty. So in a way that the law clearly prohibits uh, uh, and, and in a way which is unlawful, then um, and that those persons will not enjoy protection of the law. And this is very important. Whistleblowers who reveal human rights violations should have a public interest defense which will protect them if the information reveals criminal, including international criminal behavior by the state. That, that's very, very critical. It's a defense that doesn't exist at the moment. I, I told you what were not the defenses just now. And, uh, and uh, none, uh, this 
this public interest defense will, is something that would fail miserably under our OSA. All right? It will not be something that you can even start with. Thank you very much. That's really a, just a broad sweep of the OSA, the breaking down the OSA, where we should go from the OSA, what, what lies in international law, and how we should actually aspire for those standards. Thank you.